No, I have no volume. I'm on a Zoom call, but I have no volume. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the August 13th meeting of the Rotary Club of Pleasantburg. It's great to see everybody's face. Um, while we give everybody just a minute to still roll in, I've got a short video to start the meeting. We hope. There we go. What is Rotary? Rotary is a voluntary, non-profit, non-governmental, non-religious organization of industry professionals and academics working in intertwined autonomous networks providing self-education, exchange of knowledge, and humanitarian aid. It might sound complex, but it's built on a very simple philosophy. You go through life, working, studying, and taking care of your loved ones. But at some point, you might stop and feel this spark. An urge to not only do good, but to help others as well as yourself. Throughout life, you've had tons of ideas. All of them might not have been the most complex or the most developed, but it's the thought that counts, isn't it? When an idea is anybody introduced, there? Can we exchange thoughts, yep. knowledge, experience? Okay. Ideas grow along with ourselves. Oh, Travis, this is Robert Hanley. We know that simple thoughts can become the beginning of something huge and life changing for millions of people around the world. For us, it has led to projects like local mentorship programs, providing clean water, building school, disease awareness campaigns, scholarships, exchange programs, weeks for cancer patients, teaching kids karate, providing medical care, blood donations, fighting illiteracy, protecting mothers and children, and emergency food supplies. I think that our first project was a public toilet, and now we're on the brink of a radical it's not easy. We believe that with the right people, the smallest thing can make a huge difference. Uh, okay. So when you feel the spark, remember Rotary. Travis, you're alive? We are alive. There Let's you go. Try to share my screen and get it back to where the PowerPoint will work. Okay. Travis. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the meeting today. Hey, um, Jeanette's behind me there, huh? Let me I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I think we're back in business. Thanks, everybody, for holding on to that technical difficulty. Um, sometimes the internet and the screen share doesn't cooperate. Um, so I'd like to officially call the meeting to order and ask Bill McCann to lead us in an invocation and a pledge uh, today. All right, thanks, Travis. That, that was a great video, by the way. I enjoyed that. Thanks. Um, and I noticed there's probably about half a dozen people that are still unmuted, so we're hearing quite a bit of information coming across the screen. In any event, uh, please let us pray, bow our heads. As we gather today in the Fellowship of Rotary, Help us to not only keep in mind those less fortunate, but also help us to better understand why our nation is once again in the midst of so much unrest over why there are those who don't have the same opportunity for prosperity, which we all have enjoyed. Our international theme this year, Rotary Opens Opportunities, fits perfectly with service above self. And we ask for your help in our struggle to find the societal compromises needed to move forward with providing equal opportunity for health and prosperity for all and peace within our world. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome all the guests and vis visiting Rotarians that are joining us today. Um, it is great to have you with us. Uh, we invite you all to join us at future meetings. And if you feel that spark to help others um, and want to learn more about our Rotary Club um, and what we do in the community, 
feel free to put your email in the chat uh, box and uh, John Kimball will get back in touch with you with more information and we'll keep you abreast of all the work we're doing. Um, in addition, if you're not comfortable putting your email out to the public, John's email will be there. Feel free to contact him um, or you can leave us a message on our Facebook page um, and we'll get back with you. Travis, I put my email and phone number are both already in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. Um, one quick announcement, and that is, I just wanna make sure everybody read my email this week and saw the notice about the 2021 dues structure. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to me um, or David King. Uh, we're happy to answer them for you. Um, and we'll leave it at that for today. Um, so not to take too much time, I want to go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Um, and uh, let's see, we'll be fine, I think, with uh, questions at the end. So we're about to hear from two award-winning journalists from the USA Today Network. Marissa and Tim were part of the investigative team that uncovered the widespread sexual abuse in gymnastics in USA Gymnastics and the crimes of the former Olympic doctor, Larry Nasser, Marissa Kwiatkowski is an investigative reporter for USA Today. She handles investigations reporting to social services and welfare issues, including child abuse and neglect, elder abuse, human trafficking, and access to mental health service. Marissa has earned more than 50 journalism awards. And prior to USA Today, she worked for media outlets in Indiana, South Carolina, and Michigan. Tim Evans is an investigative reporter from the Indy Star, where he also heads the Indy Star Call for Action, a free consumer helpline that has saved or recovered more than $1.5 million for Hoosiers since 2016. Prior to the Indy Star, Tim worked as a newspaper reporter and editor in Indiana and North Carolina for over 20 years. Tim and his wife, the Reverend Jen Jennifer Evans live in Brownsburg, Indiana, and are the proud uh, parents of an adult son. Um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and turn the meeting over to Marissa and Tim. And Hello, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having Tim and I. Um, we thought, we know there might be a lot of questions. We thought we'd start by just telling you a little bit about the background of our investigation and the work that we've done and then uh, open up to you guys and what you would like to know. So um, just to start a, sort of the origin story, um, many of you, and I feel like I should mention this up front, um, recently on Netflix, there was a documentary that looked at a portion of the investigation that we did called Athlete A. And uh, that film, which is available on Netflix right now, um, has also spurred some pretty difficult conversations in gymnastics in uh, both the UK and Australia and New Zealand. So um, if you haven't seen that, that kind of gives you another window into the work that we're gonna be talking about today. And this investigation really started, um, it's crazy to think about, but uh, four years ago now, it was in March of 2016, and I was investigating systemic failures to report child sexual abuse in schools when a source had reached out and suggested that I look at USA Gymnastics and how it handled such allegations. USA Gymnastics, for those of you who don't know, I was a reporter at the Indianapolis Star at the time, and USA Gymnastics is based in Indianapolis, so there was a local connection for us. Um, and USA Gymnastics is the national governing body for the sport of gymnastics. So it is the pathway to the Olympics. So when I was talking to that source, that source pointed me toward a lawsuit in Georgia and documents that he said might soon be sealed by the judge. So there was an urgency there. And I left that call feeling like this could be something that was really important. And I tried the way journalists do every way to get access to those records without going in person. Um, I couldn't get them by phone or online. Um, there was no way to ship them quickly. So ultimately with my editor's approval that same day that I got the tip about USA Gymnastics, I boarded a plane to Georgia. And 
I ended up picking up almost a thousand pages of records while I was there, including depositions involving current and former USA Gymnastics executives. And it was those records that really launched the investigation that we pursued for the next couple years. And those records showed that USA Gymnastics had a policy of not reporting all allegations of sexual abuse to authorities unless that complaint had been signed by a victim, a victim's parent, or an eyewitness to the abuse. And so uh, one of our colleagues who's not on the call today, Mark Alicia and I started our piece of the investigation by backgrounding more than 100 coaches who had been accused of misconduct to really understand the impact of that policy that USA Gymnastics had on the safety of children in the sport. And while we were doing that, Tim was working on a national look at child abuse mandatory reporting laws. Uh, Tim, you want to talk? Yeah, I'll pick it up from here. So I, I came to this investigation like Marissa with a background in child reporting on child abuse, child neglect, and child welfare systems. And um, unfortunately, we both had written this story, the theme many times, you know, that, that is a tragic consequence of abuse. People don't report. and, and uh, and then the abuse continues. So I started out looking at the state laws in all 50 states to find out, you know, what what the requirements were. And basically, every state has a requirement that almost everyone is a mandatory reporter. Some have a heightened responsibility: doctors, teachers, professionals. But in almost in every state, if you know about abuse, you suspect abuse, you're required to report it. And that was, you know, what we were finding was that. USA Gymnastics was being made aware of abuse by coaches in different states. And if they didn't have the signed documents Marissa mentioned, they were not taking action on it. And so our investigation really tried to look at this policy and find the cause and effect. You know, there's one thing where you philosophically you should report and it's a bad thing you don't report, but is there any harm? So for those hundred coaches that they started um, backgrounding, we we developed, we found four cases. And while that may not seem like a lot, for us it was kind of gold in, in journalism terms because we found cases where USA Gymnastics had been notified about a coach who was abusing children. They'd failed to take action. That coach was allowed to continue to be a member of USA Gymnastics, continued to work with young children, mostly young girls, and molested again. So. Uh, during this process, which started in March or April of 2016, uh, we, we in, in probably about June, as we started to try to pull our story together, we uh, met, not surprisingly, great opposition from USA Gymnastics. They wouldn't talk to us. Uh, everything we had to, uh, any question we had to, to, for them, we had to submit by email. They answered a few of them. Uh, they often made a statement, but didn't answer our questions. At one point, as we were trying to get some more of these court records that had been sealed, they accused us of uh, being like the National Enquirer, trying to you know have an expose that would sell newspapers. They accused us of bad motives and being on a witch hunt, and um, later threatened to sue us, um, none of which came to fruition. But in late July, we were wrapped, we wrapped up our first story, and by the time we got lawyered and everything, it published on the 4th of August of 2016. And it revealed the policy, it revealed the, 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 stay, the stories of these four coaches who had been, uh, you know, USA Gymnastics had been warned about, some in blatant, uh, very bold terms, you know, if you, um, you know, a coach was bragging about having sex with an underage girl. Another one was, if you don't stop him, he's gonna rape somebody else. And these are the kind of things that were being ignored. It wasn't just, oh, he actually touched her bottom when she was coming off the bars or, you know, his hand slipped when he was when he was giving her uh, 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 help on 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 the beam or something like that. Because there is a lot of physical contact in the sport, but we you know I made it clear this wasn't accidental. This wasn't innocent. These were sexual acts and sexual violations. And we published our story uh, the fourth of April or of August, which was the day before the 2016 Olympics came out. And at that time, Larry Nasser, who kind of our reporting ultimately became known for, for exposing Nasser, who abused hundreds of young girls as a doctor. He wasn't even on our radar at, initially at that point. So, Marissa.
sorry, I didn't unmute. <laughs> so in the wake of that August 4th piece, you know, we were inundated, Tim and Mark and I, with messages from people asking us to look into other gymnastics officials whom they believed were pr child predators. And one of those emails came from Rachel Den Hollander, who told us that she too had been abused, but not by a coach, by a doctor. And within weeks, we heard from two others who said the same thing, that that same individual, Larry Nasser, had abused them under the guise of medical treatment. And I want to take a minute and just point out that our investigation into that doctor and into Nasser's allegations was different from anything we'd done thus far. So what Tim was talking about, most of those people, in fact, all of those people had already been either convicted of a crime or were incarcerated or had passed away. Nasser was the first person who came on our radar that we dug into who had not yet been charged or convicted of a crime. In fact, um, you know, he was still working at Michigan State University at the time. He was running for local school board. He'd established a foundation for children with special needs. He was also a gymnastics doctor at some local clubs in Michigan where he lived. And so the rigor with which Tim and Mark and I pursued the investigation became, you know, it's always incredibly important to fact check and be meticulous with every detail, but even more so when we're looking at allegations against someone who was not facing any kind of criminal charges. And so in the next couple of weeks after we got the tip about Larry Nasser, Mark went and interviewed Rachel Den Hollander. I was interviewing an individual who in our first article was listed as a Jane Doe. She's since come forward publicly, and that's Olympian Jamie Dancher. And while we were doing that, Tim was pursuing looking into the background of Larry Nasser. And one of the things I would add is, um, you know, we, we did a ton of interviews, TV and radio interviews that first day, August 4th, August 5th. And one of the questions everyone asked us was, are any of the Olympians, were any of the Olympians abused? Or were any of the Olympians victims? And at that time, before we knew about Nasser, the kids that we knew about, the young people we knew about, were club kids who were participating in their local clubs or regional athletes. We had no idea that several of the girls who were in Rio representing America had been abused by Nasser. And the fact that they performed so well, I mean, it is a testament to their, um, you know, their strength as, as humans and as athletes because they had this horrible secret that we didn't know about at the time. So, um, you know, again, my, one of my, my two tasks in this at this point were to, to find out if there was any medical procedure that was legitimate that involved uh, what NASA was accused of, which was intravaginal penetration of, of these young girls, if there was any legitimate procedure that involved that, and then to, to try to get NASA to talk or, you know, in our business, it's usually you put out a call to the, to the target or the, the target's attorney and you get back to no comment. And so that was kind of what I expect to be kind of a throwaway task. You know, I'd, I'd get the comment, no comment, and we'd move forward. So I sent NASA an email, kind of one of his emails, same an email at his Michigan State uh, University email address, and also at a personal email I'd found for him. And it's sent it late one afternoon, I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon. I came in the next morning and I had two emails from Larry Nasser, which shocked me, you know. Usually it's a threatening thing, you know, don't leave me alone or uh, you know, getting contacted by us is, is not usually a pleasant thing. Uh, people don't wanna hear from an investigative reporter. But Nasser, was very apologetic. He uh, said he was sorry that these women had misunderstood what he'd done. And he'd really like me to come and meet with him and he would explain what, it, what he had done and how they may have misinterpreted it. And, you know, that was totally out of the blue and unexpected. So uh, the second email, that one came about 7.45 in the morning. The second one had come in a little after eight. And, um, you know, by the time I got in that morning, it was, they were both there. The second one said Nasser's wife had suggested that he uh, maybe meet with his attorney and me. And so uh, I, I sent him back, yes, I'd like to meet. Uh, can we give me your attorney's contact and we'll set something up. And so again, we tried to set a meeting for Thursday, for Friday, I offered to, he was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the attorney, and I was in Indianapolis. I offered to drive up, you know, any day over the weekend. We finally settled on Monday morning, the 13th of 
I believe, of September. So I got up about 5.30 in the morning and drove four hours or whatever it was to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and met with Nasser and his attorney at about um, 10 o'clock that morning, uh, Grand Rapids time, at the attorney's office. And Nasser had a bunch of uh, magazines, articles, uh, you know, medical journals, and several videotapes he wanted to show me. So he started to show me, you know, I, I think he wanted to show, legitimize what he was doing. And he was an osteopathic physician, uh, if that makes a difference. But um, so he started to show one video and it really made me uncomfortable. It was, there was no face in it, but there was a young girl laying, with a, what appeared to be a young girl laying on, a, on her stomach on a procedure table. And he was massaging her buttocks and in between her thighs and stuff. And he, he said, you could see why they, might, why they might misinterpret what I'm doing, you know. But I, I, I you know, it, it's all legitimate. And then I asked him at that point, you know, why didn't he wear gloves? Because one of the things that I found from talking to medical experts, if you were going to do that kind of procedure, you'd wear gloves. And he said they, they impeded his ability to kind of feel the muscle, muscle and the tension and the release that he was trying to, to create in, in the tight muscles. And as we were, as we were watching that video, uh, Marissa texted me that the lawsuit had been filed against NASA. We were in, in California by Jane Doe. And at that time I stopped NASA. I felt obligated to tell him that there was a lawsuit filed. I want, didn't want him to, um, you know, go on with the interview or his attorney to go on with the interview or feel like I was trying to, um, you know, um, catch them off guard and get him to say something before when, when there was a lawsuit now, because that kind of upped the ante that he was facing. So I told him that uh, Marissa emailed me or texted me a copy of the lawsuit, which I shared with him. Uh, Nasser and his attorney went in the office and um, came back out about 15 minutes later. They, they really pushed me to try to identify who had filed the suit, who Jane Doe was. They, they suspected they knew by some of the information that was in the suit. Um, and then they said that they were going to have to stop the interview. Before they stopped it, um, NASA's attorney made one statement. And going into this, our editors and we all really feared that this was going to be a, a case that turned into a, a muddy mess of uh, medical experts. You know, one, next, one set of experts saying this, this is a legitimate procedure, another set of experts saying, no, this is not legitimate. And, you get lost the, the, the gravity of what happened to these young women. The Nasser's attorney made the statement that he had never penetrated any of these young women with his fingers during the procedures. And now if that, I, you know, I, that attorney and Nasser parted ways soon after that interview. But we had, once, once we made and published that statement, we published our story about the lawsuit that later that day. Once we published that statement, the floodgates open of women saying that's a load of um, hockey pucks because he did that to me, he did that to me, and it, and it, and it started the snowball. Um, you know, as I left, Nasser was uh, almost in tears, begging us not to do a story that it was going to ruin his life, it was going to ruin his family's life. And you know, it, it was an emotional time for me. Um, again, he, he laid it on pretty thick and you know, you, I left there thinking, gosh, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? And then have to think back to these victim stories, the survivors and all that they'd been through. And, you know, it, it was a tough decision. It, there was no great joy in, you know, hurting the man. I felt much more sorry or more, you know, sympathy for his wife and children who probably didn't know about it and were suddenly going to be shocked by what we reported. And, you know, he he knew what he was doing and had done it for years. Um, so I'll hand it back off to Marissa. So as Tim said, that one small statement from the attorney really changed the dynamic with Nasser because in the immediate aftermath of publishing that piece, there were two competing reactions. We faced a lot of pushback from his supporters who told us that we were wrong, that we were tarnishing a good man's reputation and that they were just in it for money. And yet at the same time, because of that statement that Tim mentioned, we heard from many other women who said that the same thing had happened to them. And the number of survivors continued to grow. And 
we continued to pursue stories. I think it was a, a couple weeks later, we had 16 more women who came forward and shared the allegations. He was criminally charged um, in actually three courts, two of them relating to uh, criminal sexual conduct. But really the pushback that we received did not stop until he was charged with possession of child pornography. And so in the course of executing a search warrant in his home, they found more than 37,000 images and videos of child pornography at his home that had been sitting out waiting to go and be picked up by the trash uh, company. And so, you know, fast forwarding to where we came to date, about 500 people have come forward with allegations against Larry Nasser. He ultimately pleaded guilty and is likely to spend the rest of his life in prison. He pleaded guilty both to the federal and state charges. For many people, the first that they knew about him, and maybe for some of you on this call as well, was the sentencing hearing that happened in Michigan. And one after another, the survivors coming forward and sharing their experiences and their words to Larry about what he had done and how it had affected them. And, um, you know, Tim, feel free to jump in, but there was a lot of action that took place as a result of the work that we did and the articles we continued to do. The president of USA Gymnastics resigned, as did the entire board of directors. There have actually been multiple presidents since then, uh, most of whom did not last very long. They filed for bankruptcy, and that is still pending. There are also lawsuits that have been filed both against USA Gymnastics, the US Olympic Committee, and Michigan State University. And in, I believe it was 2018, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but Michigan State University reached a settlement with the survivors of Larry Nassar that ended up being $500 million. And, um, you know, there's still a lot happening today. It, it, it's still very much in the public conversation today. Yeah, the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, stepped down during the height of it, citing health issues. Um, but it was after the real, it was revealed that he had been made aware of Nasser. The president of Michigan State University was removed. Uh, the head of the medical was the medical school or the department that Nasser was involved in was criminally charged. The Michigan State women's gymnastics coach was criminally charged, um, and Steve Penny, the former U.S.A. gymnastics CEO is facing a criminal charge in Texas of um, tampering or moving or destroying records, medical records of Nasser's treatment of uh, athletes at the famous Crowley Ranch down in Texas. And, you know, as a result of this public conversation, there's a new federal law and national governing bodies, including USA Gymnastics, USA Swimming, USA Diving, Taekwondo, are all required to immediately report allegations of sexual abuse to authorities. So no longer does it depend on the nuances of the state law, there's a federal law in place that requires them to do that and to do so immediately. Um, the other thing that happened during the course of our investigation was the creation of the US Center for Safe Sport. And that organization investigates allegations of sexual misconduct for all of the national governing bodies that are connected to the Olympic Games. And Tim, unless you have something else, um, I think we'd love to just open up for questions and, and talk about whatever you guys are interested in. Okay, um, thank you so much, Tim and Marissa, for sharing the story of that investigation. Um, before I open the floor to other people, could you also maybe tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a journalist um, today and in today's climate um, with so many important topics to cover and so many people who may not have lost trust in the media? I'll, I'll jump in on this, get on my soapbox. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we as we were rolling this out was kind of as, as the fake news, you know, label was, was coming on. And so we, we kind of faced that, you know, that kind of feedback from USA Gymnastics and others, but um, <coughs> it, it, it is hard. And, you know, I think 
the problem that journalism, that newspaper journalism, uh, legitimate journalists did, uh, got ourselves into is there's this great term, the media. And the media is, 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 is this huge conglomerate. It's people on talk radio who, uh, you know, who, who can say anything or who say anything to fit one side or the other. Uh, there are people who give their opinions. And then there are journalists who really try to go down the middle, get the facts. And as talk radio and things and the internet exploded in the 90s and early in the 2000s, as legitimate journalists, we didn't do a good enough job differentiating ourselves from the no, all the other noise. And so we get wrapped up and kind of labeled with that big, big bow that they tie everybody up in. And it makes it very hard, but I think, you know, and, and particularly at, at the local level, we, we had no, no intention other than looking into, and if we found something exposing someone breaking the law and the laws that were intended to protect children. And Marissa and I have both have a long history of doing that. In fact, I did it for years at the Star and kind of got burned out on child abuse. And I encouraged my bosses to recruit Marissa, who was in another paper doing great work. And so um, we, we were a tag team for a little while and then she took over that over. Um, but it, it's, it's a difficult thing. And I think you look at your local newspapers, your local TV stations for the most part, there are people really trying to do their best, trying to be fair, trying to do the right thing. But there's just so much other noise out there now, we get kind of all lumped into the same big pot of stew. Yeah. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Marissa, you have anything to add? Uh, you know, I, I think the only other thing I would add, I, I agree with everything Tim said, is just, you know, it could be easy to focus on a lot of that noise. Um, you know, I think for us, we've been, you know, throughout this investigation and, and through other work that we've done, just focused on the work. And the thing I think that was very helpful in this particular investigation is that we were very deliberate about linking to the source documents. So we didn't just say, according to a deposition, we linked to the deposition so that people could look at it and read it for themselves. And, you know, I think that in, in terms of creating trust and um, having people trust the work we're doing, the more that we can show what we're basing our reporting on and the more that we can, you know, link to those sorts of things, I, I think it's the better for the public as a whole. I agree. There was a question in the chat box. Um, I didn't go into all of the awards that the two of you have won. Could you... Um, would you mind sharing a couple of those with everybody? Tim, share yours. I'm so excited <laughs> for him. Yeah, well, we didn't win a Pulitzer. That's, and <laughs> there was a, you know, somewhat of a disappointment, although, the, you know, it, that, that's a long shot. We didn't do it for awards. Um, but we, we won uh, like an investigative reporters and editors, uh, which is an important newspaper group, the uh, Renner Award, which is a, a key award. Um, my induction into the Journalism Hall of Fame was based in part on that. Um, we won a, uh, what is the, the AP uh, Sports Editors Award for the best um, investigative report. That was kind of a look back at NASA. And I think we beat the New York Times, Sports Illustrated, the Washington Post, and somebody else in that one. Or were the other finalists. So that's kind of, you know, we were swinging way out of our league. I was. Marissa is in the big leagues, but um, <laughs> and uh, and when, when we, we we you know again it kind of cooled off. But when when Marissa had mentioned when they sent everybody back for the sentencing and all, and it was televised and there was this parade of survivors coming up and it was just heart wrenching. You know, we kind of got our second fifteen minutes of fame or whatever you would say there, and at at one point, um, somebody from the New York Times wrote, you know, that we should have won a Pulitzer. And so I said, that's even better for my, my obituary. You know, you can say, Tim Evans, who was robbed of a Pulitzer, uh, you know, died whenever. But other than that, um, we, we won a number of other state and regional and national awards. But um, Medal of Freedom from the University of uh, uh, Missouri School of Journalism, which was nice. And Yeah, and again, like Tim said, right, it's not about the awards. I mean, we certainly appreciate it. And I do now, uh, it's a joke between Tim and I, I refer to him in all emails as Hall of Famer uh, in honor of his recognition, which hopefully we'll get to celebrate in person post COVID. 
but you know, for us, and I think this is true of all of us, you know, when we look back at it, what we're most proud of is that other people will be safer, hopefully because of the work we've done with the changes in laws and the changes in policies and procedures, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we're hoping for and working toward. So there was another question in the chat um, that asked if you had not taken on this task, what do you think the results of the situation would have been? Uh, I think that he, Larry Nasser would probably still be working with athletes if we hadn't done the work that we've done. And, and it would probably, you know, it's impossible to say, right? We don't have the ability to look at an alternate reality, but, you know, based on what had happened for many years, I would imagine that it would be business as usual with USA Gymnastics and that this culture of being able to speak up and survivors feeling like their voices will be heard maybe wouldn't be true today. And USA Gymnastics was a golden child of the Olympic movement, you know, and in the, in the Summer Olympics, you see, you know, gymnastics is, is one of the top, top events and they're very powerful. And they were very powerful in Indianapolis and actually uh, came at us hard uh, multiple times. Uh, once involving a local police officer who uh, was a friend of the head of the gymnastics organization who uh, called us out of the blue and had an off the record meeting with us trying to, to get us off the story. Uh, and then later um, a high powered attorney who is known uh, for suing media outlets threatened us with um, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, I'm proud to say you know, we were, we were meticulous in our fact checking and our, in our reporting and we got down to, it was so nuanced as we, we, we designated a, an official dictionary for words like some or many. Can we say many when we've got four? Can we have to say some? We, we got down to those kind of little nuanced things because we were so careful and cautious. We didn't want to overstate our case and we didn't want to do anything that would, that would harm it because any error, even if it's a minor one, people will say, well, look, they couldn't get this right. So how can you believe anything else they had? So it was lots of sleepless nights and lots of just min checking minutia. Yeah. We have a, a question uh, privately that I'm going to let Tim answer. Um, but the question is about whether um, anyone thinks the Carolis knew that something was happening. You're going to let me answer that? Of course. It's <laughs> in my prerogative. It came to me, so. <laughs> there have been indications, and in fact, and, and I won't belabor it, but when, when we started out, USA Gymnastics had been told about Nasser by this young lady, uh, Maggie Nichols and, and Allie Reisman, two international level gymnasts, in, this, in the summer of 2015 about Nasser. So when we started this, we had no idea that USA Gymnastics was already sitting on this powder keg and they were trying to cover it up. And later we found emails where they were making excuses and that's asking them to make excuses for why he wouldn't be at events in 2015 and 2016. And in some of those emails, um, you know, he said, could we, could we say I'm sick or could we say I better focus on my practice? And USA Gymnastics agreed to that so not to create suspicion. Some of those emails were copied to Marta Crowley. So we know that. We know that years before, um, Dominique Mociano had raised concerns about the Crowley's treatment of people. Um, and Marta Crowley and Nasser were very close. So I, I don't know that they'd never been charged with anything. But there certainly have been indications that if they didn't know, they should have, or they, they were negligent and not watching over the kids at the ranch better. Um, I received a two-part question for you. Um, first, how does it feel to crack a story that's this big? And then second, did the investigation in USA Gymnastics lead to investigations with other positions or coaches in other Olympic sports? I'll, I'll start on a one. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Tim. I don't know if you watch these like um, fishing shows where they go out and fish for crab in Alaska or whatever. You know, ours wasn't one of those things where you pulled up a net and it was full of these giant king crab and it flooded the deck with crabs when you opened the net. Ours was like a long line. We pulled in a little bit and there was a fish. It kept pulling, there was another fish. It kept pulling, there was another fish. So it was one of those things where 
you know, now stepping back and looking, yeah, we, we, we did get a big fish on that line, but it wasn't this huge haul and drop in one big, big hit. It does feel good. Again, I think, though, the, the most rewarding thing is the, the voices of the survivors. Marissa and I have been all over speaking, uh, U.S. and other continents, speaking about this, often with survivors, and, you know, they, they, they tell us we're their heroes, which, you know, I, I get emotional talking about this, but, I mean, they're the heroes. They're, they're the ones who suffered through this, who stepped up, um, had to, to face the potential humiliation or the, the, the attack on their credibility. And, you know, it, it's amazing. And that, that, that's the most important thing to me is knowing that we helped people, we helped stop a predator and, um, you know, and hopefully made change some, help people start the healing process. Marissa? You know, I would just add to that, that, you know, I don't, we get asked that question a lot, right? Like, did we know how big it was or, or was gonna be? And, you know, I think, I love Tim's analogy. It's so perfect because, you know, the other thing is we were so involved in doing the work that we weren't thinking about what it meant, right? We weren't thinking about, wow, this is really big. We were thinking, I have to make this phone call. I have to request this record. And, you know, it's only now, four years later, that we're not, you know, immersed in it, that we start to sort of see the bigger picture that we couldn't see in the moment because it was one small story after another small story. Um, and I, I mean small in terms of the scope of everything that's happened, not in terms of the importance of it. And, um, you know, I think it's just, it's hard because you're so immersed in it and you get so invested in it to think about what it means. Um, there's a public question that asked, um, since these things have a way of servicing, how, what strategy or motivation do you think U.S. gymnastics had um, to cover this up and how did they justify their action to you in your reporting? Um, you know, I'll let Tim speak to this too. Um, you know, from USA Gymnastics perspective, according to the depositions that were taken in that Georgia lawsuit, they said that they had to balance the, um, you know, the needs of their members who are coaches and their members who are athletes, and that they didn't want to tarnish someone's reputation with false allegations. And, you know, every child expert we interviewed said that's not their role. It was never USA Gymnastics' role to determine the validity of allegations. Their role was to report it to the authorities as the law requires and let the authorities, the people who are trained to do this work, figure it out. Um, you know, and, and I think their, their response to us largely throughout the process was to point toward the things that they were doing, that they felt they were a leader in child protection and, you know, the trainings that they give and all of those sorts of things. And, um, you know, a big piece of our investigation was that we were able to prove that this policy that they had was not a policy that had been 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but it was a policy that continued to exist even today with everything that we know today. Um, so, oh, go ahead. That, real quick, just the, the motivation was, as it is in many things, money and power. You know, they, they were trying to cover their image. Uh, as when they started to roll out, they lost a lot of sponsors. Uh, you know, now they're they're facing bankruptcy um, because they mishandled it. Um. So, when you were working on this story, you were obviously employed by the parent company Gannett, which is part of the USA Today network. But you were locally at the Indianapolis Star, um, so you had several layers of um, sort of management. And as you were working on this story, the question is, um, did you follow any sort of traditional model of um, investigative journalism? And did you receive any pushback from any of your managers um, anywhere within the companies? Go ahead, Tim. I mean, I'll, I'll start, Marissa, unless you jump in, but no, and, and you know, this, uh, this was, 2016 was a difficult time for newspapers. It still is in terms of finances and money. And I will say, 
uh, we had amazing support, both uh, moral, uh, journalistic, and financial. I mean, they sent us all over the country. Uh, they paid thousands of dollars to, for legal fees to, to try to get access to records. Um, they supported us in every way. Um, it was it was an amazing experience, and particularly uh, given the, the circumstances of the newspaper industry. And I think it just shows how important that part of uh, journalism is, investigative reporting. There was a real commitment to it, and um, that's something that Gannett's been good good for. Um, there were there were crazy times. There were lots of editors. I don't know. You want to tell them about uh, the the day well, you were at IRE, weren't you, Marissa? When we had all those people on. Yes, um, there's an organization that we're involved with called Investigative Reporters and Editors. Full disclosure, I'm now on the national board, but I was not at the time. And we were at their annual conference um, to do training and to learn uh, to your question about, you know, models that we use um, in trying to, you know, build investigations. But we ended up pulling up in a conference room and working on our article because at the time, and, and Tim referenced, you know, the legal fight to get access to records. Once we intervened in that Georgia lawsuit seeking access to documents that had been sealed by the court, we knew that it was only a matter of time that it, another reporter might come across that filing, which kind of laid out what we were finding in our investigation. And so we needed to have an article ready to go in the event that it became more competitive. And so we, uh, you know, were locked down in this room working on this article. And, you know, when a bunch of journalists and their editor are locked in a room whispering about things, journalists are curious people and wanted to know what was going on. And so we had higher level Gannett uh, editors and executives kind of stopping by to say hi or say, hey, I heard you're working on something big. <laughs> <laughs> And it's funny looking back at it now because I, you know, in the years since when we've seen them, they'll be like, I remember when you were working on that, when you were at the conference. <laughs> I think once we were on a conference call and there were eight or nine different editors on, you know, normally something like this would go through three or four, but uh, lots of cooks were stirring the pot that day, which was a little crazy because everybody, you know, it's somewhat subjective how you approach something and everybody had their own idea, but we survived it. So. I'm going to wrap up with one last question with, with all the work you've done on this and your experience covering child predators, do you have any sort of advice on how people could better protect their loved ones um, when, um, the, the, when the victims are often some, I guess, somebody that they know? I think, you know, there are a number of things that I tell um, people who are passionate about this issue or who want to know what they can do, what can come out of this. And I think, you know, from a family perspective or from a loved one perspective, if you're a friend, um, creating an environment where people feel comfortable speaking up is incredibly important. So, you know, we always said as journalists, there's a difference between what we believe and what we could report. And we were honest with survivors about that because the thresholds are different. And so creating for the public an environment in which people feel comfortable sharing their stories is incredibly important. I also think that if you are in a position of authority that, again, it's not your job to determine the validity of it unless you are an investigator who is trained to do this work. And so, you know, whether it's in a sexual harassment allegation in your workplace or whether it is a child abuse allegation in a youth league or Boy Scouts or the church or whatever it may be, your responsibility is to turn it over to the authorities so that the authorities can figure it out, you know? And, and turning it over doesn't mean that you're tarnishing a good person's name. There's still a process that's in place for that. And, you know, I think, um, those are, are two of the key pieces, and I know, Tim, you've got thoughts on this as well, but, you know, there's, there's the human piece of it, which is creating that environment, and there's the law piece of it, which is what does the law and the right thing require you to be doing? Yeah, and one of the things that we get, get questioned about a lot was, 
you know, is gymnastics a bad sport? Is, is it safe for my kids or my grandkids to go into gymnastics? And, you know, there's nothing inherently bad about gymnastics. It's a great sport, uh, like any youth sports, but you just need to be careful because the reality is people who want to do bad things to the kids are going to gravitate to where they have access to kids. And you've got to be hyper vigilant. We saw situations, and this, this is no way meant to shame parents or blame them, but situations where parents would drop their kid off at the gym, and they'd come back four hours later. Um, there were some athletes who were, were good and would go to regional or state competitions. Sometimes the parent would send their child alone with the coach to an event. Sometimes they even shared a hotel room to save money. Now, those kind of things you just, you just can't do. And these predators are, are, are masters, you know. In multiple cases, we saw they ingratiated themselves with the family. They, they would be there for Thanksgiving dinner. They helped dad paint the garage. You know, they, they're, you, you've just got to be hyper vigilant. You've got to watch your children. Um, you know, there's some signs. Some of these gyms would not let parents view practice. They had to wait in a waiting room. That's a red flag because you, don't, you can't see your child. Um, a lot of these predators were photographers and they wanted to take pictures of the kids in their leotards, but they didn't want mom there because the kid would get self-conscious. Um, so you just, you just got to be careful. And, and, you know, if there need to be two adults around kids uh, in, in, in youth things, if they're alone with an adult, it's a danger. And, um, you know, and you can't, sadly, in this day and age, you can't trust anyone until you really know them. And, you know, because again, some of these people were really trusted friends and confidants of the parents of the children they, they abused, but um, just hypervigilance on the part of parents and, and, and other people around, you know, if you see something, if you see something, say something. Well, thank you both for sharing your time and um, expertise with us today. Um, as a thank you, um, we're going to put your name on a book plate um, and place it in a book in the library of Rudolph Gordon Elementary School. Um, Rudolph Gordon was a member of our club and he was the superintendent of schools here in Greenville County. Um, so um, the last thing I'll say, well, let me do this. Um, I wanna just bring to everybody's attention, um, next week we have um, a panel discussion with three local Greenville restaurateurs who are going to talk about navigating the changes in the restaurant business during COVID. Um, the 27th, we've got Christopher Richardson, who's an immigration lawyer and a US diplomat um, who served in Nigeria, Nicaragua, Pakistan, and Spain. He was also recently published in the opinion column in the New York Times um, with an article titled, The State Department Was Designed to Keep African Americans Out. Um, and then, um, September 3rd, Beth Brotherton with um, the city of Greenville is going to talk to us about the challenges of COVID and how the city of Greenville has been handling them. So we have some great meetings coming up. Um, we'd love to have you all join us back. Um, we will keep the links posted on our Facebook page as well. Um, and the last thing I'll say, in preparing for today's meeting, um, I know Rotarians understand that we end the meeting with the four-way test and that it's an important fixture that guides Rotarians in our personal lives and our professional lives. Um, last week, when I was doing some ethical training for um, the newsroom in USA Today, um, I was reminded that, net, that journalists are guided by a similar set of principles and ethical um, conduct in the newsroom. Journalists seek and report the truth in a truthful way. Journalists serve the public interest. Journalists exercise fair play and treat people with dignity and respect. Journalists maintain independence and journalists act with integrity. And with that, once again, I'd like to thank Marissa and Tim for all the ethical work they do um, to make our world a better place. And I would like to close the meeting and ask each of you to recite with me the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill to the friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, everybody. And I sure hope you have a terrific week. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Travis.
Thank you.